I think I think we can start off by set by by asking the question. Um, sort of is this fund enough is is the two billion rand or or, or the 2.3 that you've raised enough and what is the appetite do you think for further capital raising so i mean look i i um, think that you know the the the, where we're directing our money is just having a massive impact on the system you know the the if we if we weren't doing the procurement we're doing now um our healthcare workers when the crisis hits in the coming weeks we just not have the, well, in particular, not have the protective equipment that they need. They, the uh, national health system would not be able to do testing on the levels that, that, that they're going to be doing. We have an incredible kind of procurement infrastructure to do, you know, what would take the government kind of four to six weeks to procure, we can do within 12 hours. Um, that is how organized our uh, procurement infrastructure is in the, in the business for South Africa um, health work stream. So we can handle a lot more resources and direct it to, you know, much needed procurement. Um, as I said earlier, what we're hoping is that, is that because we don't want to do government's job for them, that government will compensate, Treasury will compensate us for the procurement that we're doing and we'll be able to recycle money back into additional procurement. But, um, you know, the more money we have, the more impact that we can make. There's no question about that. I mean, there isn't a... There isn't a kind of limit to that. And so, you know, we're on a major fundraising drive at the moment uh, with, uh, with corporates in particular and also foundations and international funders to try to get as much money in as we can. Um, but, you know, ultimately we will do, you know, the best that we can do with the funds that we have available and have, you know, the, the biggest impact that we can make. I would just add that, that it's not just about the kind of the, the total quantum, you know, for every... You know, I'm not sure what the number is, but even small amounts of money will have an impact in the number of masks that we can procure, the number of you know, sterile gloves, the visors, the, you know, the critical equipment that's needed out in the field. So even small donations make a big difference. You know, the people mustn't think that you know, it's only the big money that matters. You, you touched on the um, fact that the fund is not specifically there to, to cater for SMMEs. Um, in that sort of light, how does this fund, in your view, sit in or fit in with other funds out there? And, and, and how should people be thinking about um, where, where the Solidarity Fund's position is relative to other funds that might provide um, different types of support? So, you know, I think the other funds that are out there are very uh, specific and targeted funds. So if you look at, for example, the South Africa Futures Trust Fund that was set up by Nikki and John Oppenheimer, I mean, that's very focused on supporting um, um, employees uh, of struggling SMMEs, uh, distressed SMMEs. So that's a very targeted thing. I think what's... What, what you know, money that comes into the solidarity fund is basically spread across the three, three areas that I've mentioned. And I think, you know, we, we are in a unique position in the solidarity fund in that we are integrated into the national health efforts. So we know exactly what the priorities are for the national health system. We know where money is best spent on what the highest priorities are. We have the infrastructure to determine where the, the right places are to procure from at the right prices. Um, so I, th- I think we're uniquely positioned, if, you know, for someone who's wanting to make a contribution to the national health effort, uh, I think we're uniquely positioned in relation to our ability to identify what the needs are and to direct money in, in, in the right place. And as I said, there's no friction costs. So any money that comes to us, there's none of that money is going to admin or to other expenses. It all goes directly to procurement. And, and secondly, obviously, a portion of the money that comes to us is also going on to the humanitarian relief effort, which we also think is like a critical part of this that, you know, and, you know, we, we, we have to, as a country, be able to support households through this crisis and support businesses through this crisis. I mean, even though it's not within our remit, I mean, we are, are uh, um, actively kind of lobbying for uh, government support for, in particular, small businesses through this, um, that we don't lose significant parts of the productive capacity of our economy through this crisis. Has, has any work been done um, either between the, or, uh, between the public and private sectors uh, looking at how much capital we might need either you know, per capita or as a sort of um, overall amount? Um, is, is there any sort of anecdotal evidence from the likes of China or Italy 
um, to, to sort of compare what we're looking at in terms of how much we need to raise to fight this thing? So I think you've got to look at two things. I mean, the, the well, maybe, maybe three. I mean, the, 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 obviously what, 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 what has happened here is that we have a, um, a health crisis that's been precipitated by this pandemic. And there are certain uh, resources that are required to deal with the health crisis. That's getting our hospitals ready. It's, it's uh, at this stage, the biggest priority is protective equipment for, for healthcare workers, but it's also ventilators. It's also medicines. There are you know, a, a number of other um, things that are required to get the health system ready. Um, a much bigger cost is the cost of supporting households and businesses through this. So the social and economic crises that have been precipitated by the health crisis, the response to the health crisis, I think are where by far the biggest resources need to be mobilized. I mean, if you look at what other countries have done, you know, the percentage of GDP that, you know, ranges anywhere between kind of five and, I don't know, 12 or 15% of GDP that has been mobilized in those countries to support businesses. I mean, the U.S. is a two. Uh, you know, the UK started with a, a you know, 25 uh, billion pound or 35 billion pound, you know, support package that went to 350 billion pound support package. You know, we're going to need something similar here. We're going to need um, a support package for businesses that runs into the hundreds of billions of brands. And that's going to be much bigger than the resources that need to be mobilized uh, for, for the health system. And, and, and we're going to need tens of billions of rands to be mobilized to support uh, households um, to deal with issues like food, food insecurity. We've had a few questions come through around uh, local procurement of supplies or, or uh, uh, products, whether that be medical or otherwise. Um, can you just give a view or, or, or a comment on how, how local procurement is going? And if there are businesses out there who would like to participate to you know, produce medical equipment, or so how do they go about doing that? Yeah. So we, I mean, uh, I think one important context point around the health response is that we're competing, as I said, with countries all over the world. There's a massive shortage of, um, uh, of the kind of equipment that's needed, uh, protective equipment, ventilators. Um, you know, the cost of ventilators started at about 120 or 150,000 rand. Um, we turned down an order that the you know, price have gone up to a million rand for ventilator now. So there's just been this massive escalation in prices. There's, there's, this, there's, a, there's a scramble on to buy from reputable suppliers. Because obviously you can imagine the numbers of kind of uh, uh, frauds and uh, uh, defective equipment that people are putting out into the market and so on. So at this stage, given the, the, the nature of the urgency of the crisis, I mean, literally, you know, equipment needs to arrive in days and weeks. We are procuring from wherever we can find it. We don't have, if we can find it locally, that is obviously our, our preference, but, but there's very little equipment at the quantities that we require um, available locally, but, but some of our, our procurement, it has been local. Um, and obviously, one hopes that uh, as the crisis unfolds, more local businesses are able to gear up their production to meet the demand that's, that's, that's out there. But at this stage, the only lens that we've provided is, you know, where can we get the right quality at the right prevailing market price in the time, in the time frames we need available at the quantities that we need? So that has been, you know, our, our single kind of focus and obsession. Um, and as I said, you know, we, we are in on every order, we're competing with countries from all over the world and other, you know, other healthcare systems. Um, but within our procurement uh, our infrastructure, if there, if there are, um, uh, you know, we could, we could make available the details after this call. For those, you know, can, can, can make inquiries. We have a procurement office that can assess uh, if there are local companies that have, uh, have the ability to, to, to manufacture uh, for our requirements that, that they're able to um, um, submit their details and what they're able to do for us. Thanks, uh, Doctor. We, we, we had a, a few questions about sort of banking details and uh, details around procurement, so we'll make sure that we, we source those from uh, the Solidarity Fund and pass them on uh, as part of the follow-up to this call. Yeah, man, if we can just, sorry, just on, for those who want to make a contribution, I mean, we, they can go to our website and there are a number of different payment channels on our website. Our website is solidarityfund.co.za. Thank you. Um, if, just to change tax slightly, um, can, you, can you give us a, a bit of insight into um, how the fund, um, government and uh, business have been sort of cooperating and, and, and the discussions in the background? How, how is that dynamic working? 
Yeah, I mean, there's uh, I mean, there's been the most like incredible um, outpouring of commitment, both of resource, money, uh, in kind support from businesses for this national effort. I mean, it is just com- it's unprecedented what what we're seeing. Uh, business has organized themselves into, into uh, their own kind of warum entity called Business for South Africa. It's not an organized business formation. It was formed by a number of, of the different uh, um, organized business formations, but it is um, the business initiative. It's resourced by, I don't know, probably 50 or 60 full-time people who are also kind of like the Solidarity Fund. They're, they're, there are no costs or expenses being paid in Business uh, for South Africa uh, they have a number of work streams focused on the economy, on um, on the health, on the kind of you know some of the labour issues that uh, that businesses are finding, just the kind of legal issues around um, um, around uh, you know some of the the the, the, the labour challenges, um, and and obviously around kind of communications. And that business for South Africa war room is integrated into uh, what is is you know, regularly connected with the President's Command Council. So business and government are working absolutely kind of uh, um, uh, in tandem on, on addressing this crisis. I mean, it's, the, it's by far the best uh, I've seen in my kind of uh, 15 years of involvement in organized business and, and, and working with government. I mean, it's almost like the, the, you know, the public and the private responses to this crisis have kind of been merged. You know, there's one national effort and uh, um, it's well organized. It's well led both by the president and the minister of health. Uh, so I feel, um, you know, uh, very confident about the way in which we're able to align resources and energy and effort in society uh, to deal with the crisis. Uh, we seem to be getting quite a few questions around the um, sort of quantity of, procure- of procurement thus far. And um, do you have any indication of are we 50% of the way to what we need? I think that the questions tend to be mostly around medical equipment, ventilators, testing kits, et cetera. So, um, so obviously, the, our big focus has been on so the bulk of the money that we've committed. We've committed a total of about uh, 1.4 billion rand. The bulk of that, the vast majority of that is on protective equipment, both for uh, healthcare workers and for the community health workers who operate outside of the state system. Um, I would say we haven't, that we've committed that, we haven't spent all of that because we're in the market looking for orders. Um, uh, we've spent probably around three, um, of, of our, let's say, a billion rand on protective equipment, we've spent probably 300 million rand uh, but we will spend a significant portion of that, I would say, in the next week to 10 days. Um, once we've spent that, we will be together with, so, so we've also been working very closely with the, with the Mozepi Foundation, the, the Spire Fund of First Rand, um, the, the NASPAS uh, Fund that they've committed a billion rand. So we've tried to align where big foundations are, 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 have allocated significant funding to the health response to align that behind us because we've got the procurement infrastructure to do it. Um, so I've, I'm not including the contributions that have been made uh, by those entities. But I would say that, that within the next uh, week to 10 days, uh, we, we should have procured a, a very significant proportion of the protective equipment we're going to need for the next two to three months. Um, so it's not, it's, it's not all, but, but, uh, we would have made a, a, you know, uh, a, a very significant difference to, to what we require there. And, and this equipment has already begun to arrive. Uh, so there's a significant amount of equipment that's going to be arriving, you know, in the next, uh, week to 10 days of, of what we've already procured. But, you know, we, we, uh, you would have seen the, 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 the projections of the, of, you know, of the, of the peak of the crisis that have kind of been anticipated to be pushed out now. But we should be in a position in two to three weeks' time when, you know, we've significantly dealt with the backlog of PPE. Not solved the problem, but significantly impacted on that problem. Uh, just, just touching on your, on your sort of... Um, it, comment there around numbers and stats. Um, what is your view on, on the sort of quality of the information that's coming out that's, that, that, that's been given to, to the average person? Um, how, how accurate is the testing? 
how much of the testing has been done in sort of their more densely populated areas. Can you just talk sort of over, over, the, over your views of the stats in general? Yeah, so, so I, I think our stats are good. I think the issue that we have is that we haven't really got the mass testing in place that we need to really understand what's happening to the, to the epidemic. So I think that's the difficulty is, you know, in order to really judge what your um, response needs to be in relation to lockdown and so on, you really need to have very broad testing, and um, which is why you know we've put a significant amount of our resource into helping to massify the testing. I mean, we've we've enabled the National Health Laboratory Services to double their testing capacity um, through the procurement that we've just approved. Uh, so, and and also obviously the the PPE support for the thirty for the thirty thousand uh, community healthcare workers that will be in the field test testing. Only once that mass testing program has got some traction and we're getting a, much, a lot more information from the field where we have a better idea as to what real infection rates look like and, um, and, and I think have a, have a better sense. So I don't think the issue is the quality of the, of the data. I think the issue is just we don't have enough data. Just to sort of uh, follow on from that and ask you what's, what's perhaps a bit of an unfair question, but, um, and the one you probably don't want to have to answer, but when do you expect the, the, the sort of real peak to hit in South Africa? How long, in your opinion, can we expect sort of lockdown to continue? Uh, there's a few people sort of asking those, those types of questions. Um, yeah, I suppose it's a, how long is a piece that's, of street? But. That's above my pay grade. <laughs> no, so I mean, look, I, I think that, you know, if you want, if you want the best... Um, estimate of what is likely to happen um, uh, in relation to the crisis and when it's likely to peak and so on. I think that, that presentation of Professor Karim that was, was given, uh, I think, a couple of days ago, and I think it's kind of, you know, being circulated on social media now. I think we want to understand, you know, what does this look like? And also, how is government likely to respond to it? So in that presentation, there's kind of detail around if infection rates drop below a certain number per day, that's when you know they're going to start loosening lockdown and so on. So, but as I said earlier, they need to get you know better data before they're ready in a position to do that. So, I mean, my best guess is that is that we're not going to go from like total lockdown to zero lockdown. We're going to go from total lockdown to kind of partial lockdown. We're going to ease our way back into kind of full economic activity. So I think this uh, you know the the the, the economic impact is going to be felt beyond the end of lockdown um, and it's going to be tough. It, you know, the, the, the economy is going to be in a really tough place uh, for some time. And, and, and as I said earlier, I think the big, the big challenge for, for government now that, that we with, as business are working with government on is how do we make sure that we, we are able to support businesses through this tough, let's say the next six to eight months, which is the, the, the period of like severe economic contraction so that we've got businesses that can come out on the other side. Um, so it's critical, I think, that we focus on what we need to do to support businesses during, during this period. Because I think that even though, you know, we'll, we'll kind of come out of lockdown, we're not going to come out back into full economic activity where we were a few months ago. You know, it's, it's, it's not going to be that quick, I don't think. Doctor, thank you very much. We've uh, used up a couple more minutes than, than we were given. Uh, perhaps you can just give one or two closing remarks um, if people want to join the cause or if you need volunteers. Uh, how, do, how, how do people get involved? And yeah, just your sort of closing comments. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I mean, and firstly, just to thank you guys for, for giving me the opportunity to kind of you know, share this. I mean, we you know, hopefully would have got a sort of sense you know, at the fund, like we're very passionate about what we do and, and about the impact that we're able to make. Um, and, you know, I think it's really important that the fund becomes something that as all South Africans, we get behind. I think it is an initiative for all of South Africa. It's an initiative that I think is doing really important work. Um, I think, you know, uh, how people can contribute is, yes, to, to give money, but also to think of, you know, what are the acts of solidarity that they can, you know, that, that, uh, that they can do. You know, there's... there's there's helping to fundraise, there's raising awareness, there's, you know, organizing, uh, supporting, um, uh, you know, food programs, uh, there's, there's volunteering, there are lots of things. I mean, in, in relation to our capacity, we've had, you know, an enormous number of, of, of offers for, for, you know, pro bono um, um, support. 
you know, our capacity, we, we have the capacity we need right now, so we don't have additional um, uh, uh, resources required, you know, from an infrastructure and, and, and personnel point of view. Um, but, I, you know, I would really encourage everyone, you know, on this call to, to think about, you know, different ways in which they're able to, to contribute and how they can, you know, spread this kind of message of solidarity. I mean, as, as, I, as I said in the beginning, you know, we celebrate every moment and an act of solidarity. Uh, the Solidarity Fund is, is an umbrella for the, for the society and for the country um, to, to get behind. Not all the initiatives and actions are going to happen by the Solidarity Fund. It's our ability to amplify what we're doing through the acts of, 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 of individuals and organizations and communities across the country. So I we'll just encourage everyone to kind of be, become part of the solidarity effort. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, you certainly inspired a number of people. I can see some comments coming through. Um, hugely uh, thankful and grateful for your efforts and, and those of, of the team around you. So thank you for your time this morning and we wish you all the best. Great. Thanks, Matt, and thanks to the anchor team.